two billion dollars later. Pounds. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Isn't that the same thing these days? Yeah, <laughs> what does the world need to know about the UK real estate market? The world needs to know that things are not so bad in the UK. There's an awful lot of wealth that's here that has no intention of leaving. What have you kind of learned about building a business in the last 17 years? You have to know what your service is. There is a problem in the market. The problem is it's very difficult for buyers to buy property. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Real Ones. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Camilla Dell. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's been a busy day for you. Yes. Um, and I know that you have your own podcast. So I'm speaking to a bit of an expert here. Usually, my guests, they are not used to hosting their own podcast. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, being evaluated right it's now. It's <laughs> okay. It's okay. It's all good. It's, it's, it's weird to be the guest and not the interviewer. Oh, is it? But I'm sure it's fun. So I, I mean, like, you know, obviously I now know you as this magnate in the real estate space in the UK and that's awesome, but I'm sure you didn't grow up necessarily wanting to be in real estate what did seven-year-old Camilla want to be oh gosh that's a really um interesting question I think seven-year-old Camilla had absolutely no idea what she wanted to be but I think growing up um I wanted to be all sorts of cool things from prime minister to an astronaut wow. um and um I think I just wanted to have something of my own and I wanted to lead I knew mm. that and then um, you know, my journey into real estate was was a bit random, to be honest with you. I did science at A-levels. Yeah. Um, I did a degree in marine biology wow. um, because I absolutely love scuba diving. I'm a scuba diving instructor. Um, wow. So at university, I used to take trips of students out to Egypt, to the Red Sea. I used to teach people how to scuba dive. So you've been um, to my part of the world. Okay. I've been to your part of the world many <laughs> times. I'm a, yeah. yeah, big travel to the Middle East. Um, and I, I suppose that taught me that I was really good at people. And, and I used to get a real buzz and high out of teaching people and selling courses and making money. Like mm -hmm. I knew that I really enjoyed that whole process of people and selling and making money and but I didn't know, I didn't really know what to do with that. And I had this science degree and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, and after I graduated in marine biology, I lived in Egypt for a while, yeah. teaching people to scuba dive. Um, I came back to London uh, and I started working in the hotel industry um, okay. in a sales role. Uh, I think my first salary was something like 15,000 pounds a year. So wow. like, really very little for a yeah. London yeah. salary, even back then. Um, and I knew, again, I, I had some sales training in the hotel industry, and I remember the sales trainer said to me, Camilla, you were born to sell. Like, you just, you just naturally are quite gifted at it. And I thought, hmm, well, you know, the career trajectory working in the hotel industry in sales, you don't make a lot of money. Um, so I thought, well, I'm not sure I want to stay doing this. And I remember at the time I was an avid reader of the Guardian newspaper okay. and they used to advertise, this is old school, go back, I'm now showing my age, but they used to yeah. advertise in their job section. I always used to see adverts for Foxton's. Hmm. Foxton's is a big real estate company here in London. And their adverts always used to catch my eye because they were quite cool. They were like yeah. people jumping out of planes, skydiving and you know, just Foxton's crazy stuff. That. Foxton's. That's You're how they kidding. were recruiting. Their adverts were very Red adrenaline, <laughs> Red Bull. <laughs> Red Bull didn't exist then. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, you know what? I went online, I had a look, I applied, and literally my phone rang that same day, and it was the recruiter wow. going, hi, you know, come in for an interview. And I went in for an interview the next day, and the interview was just off the wall. It was a drinks party. <laughs> um, you know, it was very, very, very different. And I got offered a job almost immediately, and I had of my notice in and, and I never looked back mm. um, but interestingly at Foxton's I didn't have a driver's license so oh. I was never an estate agent okay um, they put me in their head office and my role was to look after relocation agents and buying agents and be their main point of contact within that business okay. um, and that's really where I started to look quite carefully at this whole concept industry now of buying agents to really understand what is that? you know what it is and and I just thought wow that is 
great, how fantastic to be able to represent the buyer mm. and go on this whole journey with the buyer and not be restricted in terms of what you can sell um, by being an estate agent and predominantly focusing on what you have on your own books. As a mm. buying agent, you're free to go wherever you need to to find the right property for your client. So I started to get very, very interested in that industry um, whilst working at Foxton's. Um, but I was at Foxton's for four, four and a half, five years. Um, Whilst I was there, I applied to go on The Apprentice. Um, wow. <laughs> almost made it onto season two of The Apprentice, um, but not quite. But I remember I, I had to tell Foxton's that there was a possibility I was going to be on the show. <laughs> um, and, um, and John Hunt, who owned Foxton's, said to me, if you're on the show, make sure you win. And we're yep. going to put a big F for Foxton's on your forehead so everybody <laughs> knows where you came from. But to cut a long story short, I, I didn't get on. And um, I stayed at Foxton's. I got promoted. They obviously saw that I must have been bored to start applying for The Apprentice at the time. But what, what that whole process showed me, because I think it was 75,000 people applying to go on The Apprentice in those days and narrowed it down to like 12 candidates. So I thought, well, there's something here. I thought, I really want to run my own business. And, and I thought that is buying agency. And I started writing a business plan. In the meantime, I got called by Knight Frank. They headhunted me to go and work for their buying agency part of their business. Yeah. And I really went there in all honesty to test drive my business plan. Mm -hmm. um, and after eight months, I knew that I could do it on my own. Um, and I handed my notice and I set up Black Brick in January 2007. Um, and that was really where, where it all started. And here I am almost 20 years later. 20 years and $2 billion later also, I believe. Pounds. Pounds. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Isn't that the same thing these days? Yeah, almost. Yeah, parity. No. Yeah, not far off. No, that's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's obviously... Uh, tell me about what this difference is between the buying agent yeah. and everyone else, right? Like, I, I don't fully understand it. Yeah, so... Here in the UK, we have estate agents and estate agents represent sellers. Mm. So, you know, their business model is to market and advertise properties for sale and to try and sell those properties for the highest price they possibly can. Mm. Um, and they get paid a commission by the seller. The seller is their client right. and that is their main focus. Um, my business is the complete opposite of that. Um, we are buyer's agents. We're a buying agency. So what we do is we represent the buyer. Mm. Um, and everything we do is about advising the buyer to make sure that we understand their brief and what they're looking for. And then we go out into the market and represent them. Um, the market here in London is pretty difficult to navigate. Okay. Um, if you're a buyer, there are now over 7,000 estate agents in London. Um, and not all estate agents share instructions. Yeah. There is no multi-listing service here yeah. like you have in America. Mm -hmm. So if you're a buyer and you're looking to buy a flat in, let's say, Kensington and Chelsea for £2 million, right. you'd probably have to speak to over 50 agents to really make sure that you're covering everything. Yeah. And even when you're speaking to that many agents, you're still potentially not getting access to the whole off-market world as well. So mm -hmm. for a buyer without a buying agent representing them, firstly, it's incredibly time-consuming. Most buyers don't have the time, patience, inclination to contact 50 agents. They wouldn't even know who the 50 are to speak to because there's a lot of independent agents now that work from home. They don't have offices. Some of them don't even have websites. So unless you know who they are, mm -hmm. you don't know how to reach them. Um, and then getting access to off-market is very difficult for buyers unless you have prof professional representation. Okay. So, you know, the role of a buying agent is to advise and work for the buyer, to help them navigate the market, to find them the right property. That might be a property that's on the market, off the market, about to come on the market, but get them in the door early. Um, and then once we have found something that's right for them to help them understand pricing and to negotiate on their behalf to secure the property they want on the very best possible terms. Um, and to give you an idea, on average, we tend to save clients at least 4% off the asking price. And on average, around 50% of properties that we find for our clients are not being advertised. They're completely mm. off market. Right. So that's the role of the buying agent. The role of the buying agent is to guide and advise and work for the interests of the buyer. Right. Um, because otherwise, buyers without representation, it's a pretty unfair, unbalanced 
scenario I like to kind of uh, draw an analogy it's a bit like going to court and representing yourself and not having a lawyer <laughs> it's the same in the London property, property market if you're a buyer and you don't have a buying agent no. you're kind of exposed you have nobody representing you and that there's the seller they have their appointed agent representing them fighting their corner trying yep. to sell their property and get the highest price and the buyer has nobody representing them to me you know when buying real estate is often one of the biggest value transactions a lot of people will ever do in their lifetime why wouldn't you pay for somebody to advise you mm, yeah i mean uh, like how do you kind of cement yourself at that you know obviously you've got a very unique value proposition yeah. which is the buying agent component but it's not easy to build a, the kind of business that you've built i believe 17 years now yes is that right? yeah. yeah so that's a huge feat in its own right yeah what have you kind of learned about building a business in the last 17 years that you feel like other people should really take away from this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there's so many different elements to building a business. I think one is you have to know, um, you know, you have to know what your service is. You have to, you know, have have a service and offering um, that resonates. Mm -hmm. And I think that this absolutely resonates. I think that there is a problem in the market. The problem is it's very difficult for buyers to buy property, yeah. whether that's they can't find what they want or they have bad experiences with agents or they don't understand pricing and they, you know, um, and then on the negotiations, things go wrong. So I think there is a, there's a need. So it was kind of understanding that need and then developing, you know, this service to address that need and then going out to market to really promote it. And um, I think fundamentally, you know, once you have an idea, um, you know, you have to keep testing it and um, and tweaking it and developing it. Um, you know, but this business is all about relationships and contacts. And I've worked very, very hard over the last 17 years to build my brand, but also to build relationships with a lot of corporates. We're now on the panel of a lot of private banks. Mm. Um, private banks love our service. Uh, they love the fact that we represent clients. Mm. Um, and so we're not trying to sell them anything. We're there to advise. Yep. Um, so, you know, historically, we used to get a lot of um, referrals from private banks. Now, 17, 17 years later, that's expanded to all sorts of professionals that refer clients to us but we also generate our own business through word of mouth through referrals repeat business clients finding us online if you're looking for a buying agent in London Blackbrick will pop up as one of the first companies so we've invested a lot in SEO um, I think the other thing about building a business is people and recruitment you know I made a lot of mistakes early on yep. um, and you kind of learn in terms of you know what works in terms of building your team um, and, and how to be a better boss as well and how to lead and how to get the best out of people. Um, you know, so it's it, it's trial and error as well in the early days. Yeah. But I think over time, um, you know, you understand what works um, and, and you keep going. That's awesome. And uh, you mentioned SEO and, you know, obviously the media component of your mm. business. You're extremely successful. I, on the other hand, I'm still like working my way up there. So I get why I need to podcast. Why do you podcast? So I set up my podcast. It's called Finding Perfect Property. I'll uh, link it in the bio. Diary yeah. of a Buying Agent. Um, so I set that up really as a way to um, bring on what we call our little black book. So at Black Brick, we get asked a lot by clients to introduce them to all sorts of other professionals, whether that's a law firm for tax advice or real estate conveyancing, whether that's an interior designer, a security firm, a contractor, um, schools advice, uh, private banking, mortgage advice. We get asked a lot by our clients to introduce them to experts. So I thought to myself, it would be great to have a podcast where I bring on each month um, somebody from our little black book. Um, they then get an opportunity to talk about how they help and add value to our clients. Um, and and we get to put that out to, to our network. And I think it's added a lot of value. Uh, you know, I've had some amazing feedback from um, people that have listened and then reached out to some of my guests. So they've benefited from it. So, um, and we're also collaborating. You know, I had Catherine Pooley on my podcast last month. She is an award-winning British interior designer. You know, so we're partnering with really great brands, complementary brands, um, and, and kind of supporting and, and collaborating 
with each other, which I think is, is really important. Wow. I, I have not really heard uh, that across the UAE and the UK, to be honest. She's big in the Middle East. She was born in Bahrain and she really? had a lot of clients in the Middle East. So oh. you should know her. No, I mean, not not her. I mean, oh. I, I meant the concept of, I mean, I haven't heard of her. That's new. But uh, hi, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, if you're listening to this. Uh, but, you know, I'm talking about the concept of podcasting with a potential um, group of stakeholders that are very yeah. relevant to real estate, yeah. but don't typically get asked the questions just because, yeah. you know, it doesn't come to mind. And like a lot of agents, what I've seen, like in Dubai, especially agents just interview other agents. Sometimes. Yeah, I think and that's then, a bit boring. Yeah. And then you have, oh, what's the price per square foot here? Oh, OK. Why yeah. is downtown a good, you know, investment today? La la la. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of that out there. I wanted a podcast that was a bit different, that was talking about, you know, yeah. all the other areas around real estate that clients need help and support with. Right. Um, you know, so that's really the purpose of, of, of my podcast. Right. And, um, you know, you've had all this success. Right. And uh, I was able to identify that even as someone that doesn't even live here. Talk to me about a not so successful time. Right. Uh, mm. A tougher time. Yeah. I mean, I suppose. Um, I mean, let's look at the pandemic. I mean, that kind of just threw everybody um, off track. And suddenly we went from this business where everybody was in the office. Um, I was traveling all over the world on business trips, marketing, uh, black brick, getting clients to suddenly just being grounded. I remember I was in New York um, on my final business trip um, and, and I literally left New York before it locked down. And, um, you know, so that was um, that was a tough time at first because suddenly we were all at home and I was like, you know, how am I going to continue to be relevant and how am I going to continue to put myself out there but you know pretty quickly I adapted um I started doing a lot of um webinars on zoom um so continuing to do my marketing and my market updates but just in a different way which actually um suddenly made me think you know maybe I don't need to get on planes as much because I can reach out and speak to an audience of thousands and not mm. leave my living room so that was kind of revelationary to me mm. um but I think you know the pandemic um was tough for a lot of people for us actually we were one of the first industries to go back to work so in May Boris Johnson said right if you're in real estate get back to work so like we were like a valuable industry and um and thankfully our real estate market did pretty well um mm. during the pandemic everybody played a lot of importance on the value of their home so we got quite busy with domestic clients wanting to move improve get bigger homes with gardens this kind of race for space phenomenon we we definitely capitalized on so but I think post COVID um, there were challenges you know um, I was very keen to get back to the office as soon as I could mm. and I think in my business other people took a different view and and actually suddenly wanted a bit more flexibility. So you just had to learn to adapt and change. Um, and so I think that, you know, the COVID and post COVID era, era, I think has been challenging um, for, for, for me. And I think for a lot of other business owners. Yeah. What does the world need to know about the UK real estate market? I think the world needs to know that things are not so bad in the UK. I think that <laughs> the British press um, are their own worst enemy in mm. kind of just, you know, you read it and you just think that it's doom and gloom and anyone with any money is up and leaving and going to live in places like Dubai because they don't want to pay tax. And, you know, look, I'm not saying that some wealthy people haven't left, but there's an awful lot of wealth that's here that has no intention of leaving. And I think that the UK is still a brilliant place to be an entrepreneur, to run a business, to educate your children. Um, it still has a lot going for it. And yes, you pay more tax here. But I think, you know, honestly, when I look at where else I would want to move to, and I sort of looked at, you know, where would I move to if I really felt that the UK tax system was so punitive, I didn't want to do it anymore. And I really struggled to think of where I would want to go. Mm. You know, I'm sorry to say, I would not want to move to Dubai in it's not for 50, <laughs> 60 degree heat, you know, and floods. And, y y you know, I just wouldn't. So... You know, I think the world needs to know that the UK is um, is still a great place to come um, and visit, great place to have a holiday home, great place to invest, great place to educate your children. Um, and don't be put off by a lot of negative headlines because actually, you know, underlying that is still a very active property market. Right. And obviously there's this, um, you know, 
relatively recent debate around the estate agency and the brokerage kind of model. Yeah. What do you kind of subscribe to and, you know, how do you uh, find that debate going forward and what do people need to do to evolve? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, as a buying agent, I kind of, I'm able to kind of take a step back from that because mm -hmm. I'm on kind of not, neither side of that. What I do is kind of very, very, very different. But um, I think there's room for both models in the mm -hmm. market and that's what we see today. We see, we see that there is room for both. I think... Um, depending on what kind of individual you are, the self-employed broker model will work brilliantly for certain people and it will work, won't work so well for others. So I think it's nice that there's choice out there, yeah. both for people that want to work in the industry, but also for the consumer in terms of who they want to work with to sell their property, that there is so much choice out there. And I think that that's a good thing. Gotcha. And um, we were talking just before we started filming yeah. about uh, women in real estate. Yes. Basically. And um, why are there so few successful uh, at the top kind yeah. of uh, women in real estate? Because if I did this in Dubai, you can bet you I can get an easy 50-50 ratio, right? Yeah. Whereas here, it's a struggle um, for me to find and then obviously bring on, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, why, why is that the case out here? I think traditionally, real estate in the UK has been very um, male-dominated industry and a very white male-dominated dominate, industry. You know, public school, um, you know, and, 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 and traditionally that is how it has been. And I think it's taken the industry a very long time to evolve. Mm. Um, I think in terms of the, the, the women in, in, in this industry piece, honestly... I found that that worked to my advantage, um, not necessarily so much at Foxton's. They were a very, very entrepreneurial, forward-thinking firm. So I never felt, um, you know, being a woman at Foxton's that I was any different to anyone else. But certainly when I moved across for Knight, for, for, to Knight Frank, when I arrived there in 2005, 2006, I looked at the sort of the senior leadership there and there was only one female proprietary partner. I remember mm. that very vividly. Eliza Lee, bless her soul, she's since passed away. But I did think to myself, wow, there's only one female proprietary partner, what chance do I have? And that was definitely a decision-making factor for me in leaving and setting up on my own. But I think, unfortunately, industry here doesn't take massively great care of, of, of women. You know, women will get married, they will get pregnant, they will have babies, they will take time off work. They will go through the menopause, you know, and I think employers, unfortunately, haven't found ways to get the best out of women and support them going through those changes. And so you see a lot of women who've had amazingly fantastic careers within corporate agency leave after eight, nine, ten years because they don't feel like they're being supported by the corporates. They don't feel like they have the same opportunities for promotion. No. Some of them feel, you know, that the fact that they may go on mat leave again to have a second child is working against them. I, I mean, I hear this a lot and it makes me incredibly sad. Mm. Um, you know, and I, you know, thankfully for me running my own business, um, I had those issues, but they were my issues. It was like I was completely in control. Um, I made a lot of sacrifices. You know, I, I, I have two children, but in the early days of setting my business up, I didn't spend a massive amount of time at home. Um, you know, so you, you, have to, you have to make sacrifices and it's a juggle between whether those sacrifices are worth it because the monetary reward is there or not. And I think sometimes with these big corporates, they're expecting a lot from the women. They're not necessarily supporting them through these changes. And, and the monetary benefits aren't enough for them to make those massive sacrifices. So something has, has to change. Yeah. Um, but I think, look, I think the industry is moving forward. I think there is a lot more diversity now in the real estate industry in the UK than, than there has been, but definitely more needs to be done. No, I, I, I completely resonate on, on that end. And if I was, let's say, hypothetically, me, new agent in town in, in the UK, what should I be doing? What would your advice to me be? So I get a lot of people wanting to work for me and be a buying agent with zero experience. Just send them this clip. <laughs> and the first thing I say to them is don't run before you can walk. There's no shortcuts. You know, to be a buying agent, you have to absolutely understand the market. You know, clients come to us because they are struggling to find what they want. They often have been out looking on their own with estate agents and they haven't had a good time of it. So they're coming to us for 
huge amounts of expertise. Mm. Um, so you cannot just be a buying agent with no real estate experience. You know, when I hire buying agents, we're looking for at least a minimum of five years, but potentially more mm. experience to come on board and work with us because you have to have that behind you to be able to advise buyers. I think advising, you know, demanding difficult buyers requires a lot of experience you can't just so i you know i think for somebody new coming into this industry and thinking about whether they want to advise on buy side is go and be an agent first you know go and be an agent first ideally in prime central london you know work for one of the big corporate agents because they do have great training programs um y you know and and learn the market before you just think about working on the other side for okay. buyers so I have two final questions for yeah. you, right? Um, one of them being, and this can be a quote or a principle, but what's your favorite quote about entrepreneurship that you kind of live by? My favorite quote probably goes back to John Hunt, who um, owned Foxton's and then sold it for 360 million pounds. And he was my boss when I was at Foxton's. And he would say, don't leave anything on the table until the next day. So when I'm leaving my office and I'm just thinking, have I done everything today that I needed to do? Don't put off today to tomorrow. Whether that's a follow-up email to someone that you've met to say it was great to meet you and can we go and have a coffee or whether it's sending terms of business out to a new potential client or putting something on your CRM system or whatever it is, do not think, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. Right. Like do all your follow-ups on the day. Wow. Uh, I love that. And uh, my final question to you is, what advice would you give your 21-year-old self? Ooh, be braver. Mm. I think as successful as I've been and people, it's lovely to hear that people view me as really successful. I do sometimes think to myself, it could have been bigger. Mm. It could be bigger. But I, I think sometimes um, I, I'm a little bit too cautious Mm. of an entrepreneur rather than a massively risky entrepreneur and obviously with more risk comes bigger rewards but what kind of risks would you have taken you think um you know probably looking at more international expansion um you know being braver in in terms of expanding um and um because i think that there is a need for this kind of service in all markets not just london um we actually have a company called Nomad Homes in Dubai, yes. which does focuses on buyer representation. Okay. It's a tech-enabled real estate play. So they're focused on um, creating yeah. the customer dashboards and these kind of things mm -hmm. just to enhance the buyer experience. And mm -hmm. there's very few people that actually, like you said, focus yeah. on that side of the yeah. business. Um, and I think they're one of the few players out there that actually look at that. So if you ever do decide to come out to Dubai, give me a call. Um, we're we're out that. there to... Um, you know, like definitely welcome a big part of the UK market. I think there's this camaraderie almost like, you know, six months of the year is spent in Dubai, six months of the year is spent in London. Yes. <laughs> uh, for those that have the flexibility to do that. Um, but Camilla, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So much Thank you for having time. me. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, been this week's episode of The Real Ones. Come back next week for yet another um, episode. And don't forget to smash that subscribe button. Um, see you in the next one.